The Lord of the Rings is foundational to what we now call pop culture, and despite being published almost 70 years ago, it remains familiar and formative in many people's lives. But it hasn't always been that way. Once upon a time, The Lord of the Rings was just a whimsical, unusually long children's book written by a tweed-wearing Oxford professor. So how did this story go from being an obscure oddity to a cultural cornerstone? I'm Jess, part-time hobbit, and today we are going to discuss the history of The Lord of the Rings, from its lackluster initial release to its current status as a pop culture icon. The author of The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien, had been telling stories and building worlds in one way or another since he was a very young child. As a child, he was taught English, Latin, and a little bit of French, but he was most fascinated by the sight of Welsh coal trains going by, marked with words that seemed strange, unpronounceable, alien, and yet utterly fascinating. Tolkien would carry on with his higher education, but never lost this, this interest in languages. He would often invent them entirely on his own in his free time, perfecting the tiny details and minutia that make a language feel real and lived in. It wasn't until Tolkien had been shipped off to the trenches of World War I that he began to develop a world around these languages in order to lend them depth and history. Though they were only a very rough framework for what was to come, the stories that Tolkien dreamed up in the trenches would stick with him all the way back from the war to his new job as a professor at Oxford University. Despite the fact that he was constructing this entire world and mythos, Tolkien's first serious published work was something else entirely. He typed out the silly little story he'd been telling his children at bedtime, and by the time he was done, he had a full novel ready to be published. The book told of a large-footed creature called Bilbo Baggins, who was whisked out of his idyllic countryside home off to a world of adventure. It was called The Hobbit, and all 1,500 copies that had been printed for its initial release sold out within the first few months. The Hobbit was fairly well received, and in the words of its very first reviewer, the 10-year-old son of one of Tolkien's publishing agents, it is good and should appeal to all children between the ages of five and nine. Although The Hobbit enjoyed moderate success and was able to sell internationally, any chance it had of becoming a larger cultural icon was pretty much crushed by the rising pressures of the Second World War. Still, after the success of The Hobbit, Tolkien's publishers wanted more. In his many attempts to write a sequel for The Hobbit, Tolkien threw a lot at the board. A story about a farmer named Giles who befriends a dragon, a collection of poems and short stories about a guy named Tom Bombadil, but none of these quite fit the bill of what they were looking for. So instead, Tolkien decided to give his publishers the exact opposite of what they wanted. Using the world he had started to build years before, Tolkien fleshed out the details of The Hobbit and then wrote Onward. This new story was incredibly long, complex, and had a much darker tone than The Hobbit. While the prequel was a children's story, this new tale was undeniably an epic. Publishers decided to trust Tolkien, though, and in July of 1954, The Fellowship of the Ring hit shelves. And well... Okay, yeah, it was actually kind of an unimpressive reception. Many academics left it glowing reviews, calling it the greatest work of imaginative fiction in the 20th century, and comparing it to the likes of Paradise Lost. But not everyone was so engaged. The infamous review by Edmund Wilson, titled Ooh, Those Orcs, tore the trilogy to pieces, calling it an overgrown fairy story and claiming that only sad, juvenile people would enjoy it. Well, guess what, Edmund? Maybe I I am sad and juvenile, and maybe I like my fairy stories overgrown. What are you gonna say about that? Incredibly vocal critics aside, one of the primary critiques leveled at the trilogy was something entirely unrelated to the actual quality of the writing itself. The question repeated again and again was, who's the target audience for this? The Hobbit had clearly been a children's book. You know, perhaps it would be enjoyed by the, the adults that read it to their children, but the target audience was pretty obvious. But The Lord of the Rings was far murkier. At the time, there wasn't really an adult fantasy genre in literature. Sure, in some classics, like Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, there would be some elements of, of the other world, 
And even more contemporary authors like Charles Dickens made use of unreality, like in, in A Christmas Carol with the Ghosts. But stories with elves and, and wizards and talking trees that were intended for adults it was practically unheard of and hardly a lucrative financial endeavor. They couldn't figure out who to market the book to, and without any real advertising, The Lord of the Rings had very little reach outside of the literary circle it had originally been released to. So the only real recognizable Lord of the Rings fandom that we see as we get to the end of the 1950s was from already established sci-fi fan groups. Through fan-published magazines and self-organized conventions, they had formed a community to discuss and and enjoy the growing sci-fi subculture. And although The Lord of the Rings certainly wasn't science-y, it was a topic of discussion in many of these circles. The Lord of the Rings had yet to find its target audience, but that doesn't mean that its target audience wasn't already there waiting for it. The United States was in a pretty delicate state in the mid-1960s. The civil rights movement, America's involvement in the Vietnam War, and, and the rise of counterculture, among other things, had America more divided than ever. Dissatisfied with the way that the country was being run, younger generations started to establish their own identity and groups outside of the established norm. Central to our conversation is the hippie movement. Hippies developed out of the bohemian and beatnik subculture cultures of the 1950s, and they were characterized by a very non-traditional and joyful approach to life. Hippies embraced new psychedelic music that I can't play on YouTube, and, and used mind-altering drugs that I also can't name on YouTube, and just did a lot of <laughs> that I, on second thought I also can't say on YouTube. The hippie movement shunned traditional morals and values and sought to return to a less highly industrialized, less regulated state. So inherent to this movement was a sort of nostalgia, a pining for the days before cars and computers and nuclear families and nuclear bombs. Nostalgia has been psychologically proven to be an incredibly powerful coping mechanism, and it's something that people lean on, especially when they're in times of stress and don't see a lot of hope for the future. So within this newly fast-paced world, with constant political unrest and looming threat of war, many in 1960s America reached for nostalgia, a chance to reminisce about a better past rather than worry about the uncertain future. And curiously, much of this nostalgia leaned towards the medieval era's aesthetics. According to those who were looking fondly back at it, the Middle Ages was characterized by chivalry, order, and an untouched pastoral countryside. These values were highly sought after and longed for by many generations, all the way from the Victorians to the hippies. If you're curious to learn more about our tendency to reach towards the medieval era for nostalgia, Kaz Rowe made an excellent video about medieval revival fashion that covers it in extreme depth, so I'll link that in various places if you want to check it out once this video is done. Hippies adopted this imagined medieval aesthetic into their clothing, their music, and as we'll come to see, the media that they consumed. Simultaneously, the world was also in the throes of Beatle mania. By 1965, the British band The Beatles had become so insanely popular that a lot of fans literally worshipped the ground that they walked on. Their popularity contributed to a rise of Anglophilia, or non-British people that are obsessed with British culture. Fun fact, when I moved back to America after living in England for a couple of years, a girl became friends with me just because I had a British accent and she was a really big Harry Potter fan. The same thing did not happen when I was a child with an American accent in England. I, I got bullied a lot for that one, but... Hey, Anglophilia is real, and it can help awkward children make friends. In the mid-1960s, America's melting pot was chock full of medieval-interested, British-obsessed hippies, and it really wouldn't take much for that to boil over. And in the end, that push only happened because of a copyright law mishap. Hardcover copies of The Lord of the Rings were first published by the publisher Allen and Unwin in England. A year or so later, the American publisher Houghton Mifflin, with the permission of Allen and Unwin and having purchased the rights, began selling hardcover copies of the books in America. However, to save cost, they actually imported the actual printed pages that had already been printed by Allen and Unwin and simply rebound them in America to sell. And that seems like a, you know, smart little way to cut costs, right? Wrong, actually. American copyright laws were and 
I would say still are, incredibly confusing and very, very stupid in my professional opinion. Basically, although Houghton Mifflin had purchased the rights to The Lord of the Rings, because they hadn't technically printed and published a full copy in America, by the time five years had passed, they kind of forfeited the rights. I say kind of because, again, the copyright laws are so stupid and poorly written that I don't think anybody has actually figured out whether or not they had the rights up until this day. Houghton Mifflin's competitor, Ace Books, saw this loophole and decided to take advantage of it. Without owning the publishing rights, contacting Alan and Unwin, the original publishers, or Tolkien himself. Ace Books copied the pages from the Houghton Mifflin edition, rebound it in a paperback copy, and started selling it for 75 cents, or around $7 today, adjusted for inflation. This was not only way cheaper than the Houghton Mifflin edition, because, you know, they didn't have to pay for the rights, but it was also the very first paperback copy of The Lord of the Rings to be made. Now, I didn't know this, but apparently back in 1965, when all of this was going down, there was actually a pretty harsh stigma in the writing community and publishing community against paperback books. They were seen as cheap and flimsy, and even Tolkien himself had said no to paperback copies of The Lord of the Rings being created because he thought it would cheapen the experience. However, Ace's dubiously legal paperback copies of The Lord of the Rings were selling like crazy. The low cost and simple but very eye-catching covers made it fly off of shelves, particularly in college campuses, where young beetle-brained hippies were fascinated by the strange medieval-inspired epic. Pushed into a corner, the American publishers that actually had some sort of a legal claim to the rights to The Lord of the Rings decided that they were going to push back. To compete with the cheap, poorly made Ace versions, they used the publisher Ballantine Books to produce an officially licensed paperback copy of the trilogy. And this was the best choice that they possibly could have made. The kerfuffle over the rights had already made headlines, and that joined with advertising efforts from Ballantine Books, such as posters and pins. It made the Ballantine release of the paperback Lord of the Rings massively successful. The Lord of the Rings was the number one New York Times best-selling book for eight weeks running, and it remained on the bestsellers list for many months and years to come. And it seems that The Lord of the Rings had truly taken root in younger audiences. Paperbacks were seen as books for the people, rather than the very establishment hardcover books, and college students across America had already begun adopting certain books like The Catcher in the Rye as so-called cult classics that would be shared with everyone that they knew. The Lord of the Rings fell into this at the perfect time. Cheap, accessible, and ripe for sharing and discussion. Groups began to sprout up dedicated to discussing The Lord of the Rings and its magical world, including the Tolkien Society of America, which had gathered over a thousand members in just two years. Conventions were formed for fans to meet up, or pre-existing conventions were swamped by Lord of the Rings fans, and it seemed that high school and college-aged kids had truly adopted The Lord of the Rings as part of their popular culture. And as with any fads within youth culture, people began to speculate on why they liked it so much. What followed was a flood of news articles and essays about this new cult. In his incredibly comprehensive essay on the subject, Joseph Ripp says that during 1966, the press was mostly interested in describing the simple fact of Tolkien's sudden popularity. The tone of these pieces was generally mildly condescending. One such article, titled The Hobbit-Forming World of J.R.R. Tolkien, which, yes, contains far, far too many Hobbit puns, discusses what they call Tolkien people. It talks about the pins that they would wear that said Frodo lives and Gandalf for president, the way that they would write messages to each other in Elvish on subway walls, and the way that they would gather in groups to discuss the books and learn Tolkien's languages. It also pries into why these young fans would be so engaged in Tolkien's work. The article suggests it may be the escapist nature of The Lord of the Rings, or the way it discusses relevant themes like nature, war, and loss, or people's natural inclination towards history and nostalgia. The author eventually comes to the conclusion that Tolkien people share the Hobbit spirit the pluck, the taste for adventure, the joie de vie, and above all, 
the total commitment to their goals, once they decide to have goals, that unite them all. It's a fine article, and honestly a pretty decent conclusion, but I think what's most interesting about it is the fact that it was written at all. The press just couldn't seem to leave this Tolkien fad alone, and between the cult-like following that it had gained, and the constant eye that was on the fans, the Lord of the Rings began to morph into one of the worst things possible. The term that is a death knell to every new hip trend, the thing that could make hipsters quake in their Doc Martens, the Lord of the Rings had become mainstream. I'll give you all a moment to recover after that, that jump scare. But seriously, the Lord of the Rings turning mainstream had turned a lot of people off of it, not the least of which was its actual author. Tolkien had maintained a fairly close connection to his audience, you know, taking their calls, frequently doing interviews, and replying to almost every one of their letters. Faced with the black hole of fame, he had to shut himself away from the public eye, no longer able to engage in his work work and in his fan base in the way he once had. But this fame, if nothing else, was very profitable, so publishers did what they do best and capitalized on it. They went back through Tolkien's previous works, publishing many of these more obscure stories, including a lecture he had done called On Fairy Stories. This essay, which I have recommended to you guys in the past and will presumably continue pushing on you guys until I am legally forced to stop, is essentially Tolkien's thoughts on his own writing. From his own personal philosophies, to his thoughts on the newly birthed epic fantasy genre, and after being published, the essay actually gained some serious scholarly attention. And as The Lord of the Rings slowly leached out of the public zeitgeist, it found a second home there under the careful eye of scholars. People began to discuss the story itself, rather than being obsessed with the culture around it, diving deeper and deeper into Tolkien's magnificent trilogy. Joseph Ripp explains that at a time when most public media appeared uninterested in The Lord of the Rings except as a youthful fad, the appearance of real criticism suggested the book might in fact prove to be something more durable. And durable? it was. Although no longer appearing in headlines, The Lord of the Rings had made an undeniable impact on culture. It essentially birthed the modern fantasy genre, especially epic fantasy books. Hardly any modern fantasy story can deny drawing some inspiration from The Lord of the Rings, if not in the story or the world, then in the publishing structure, a united trilogy marketed towards young adults. The late but incredibly great fantasy author Terry Pratchett wrote Wrote, J.R.R. Tolkien has become a sort of mountain, appearing in all subsequent fantasy in the way that Mount Fuji appears so often in Japanese prints. Sometimes it's big and up close. Sometimes it's a shape on the horizon. Sometimes it's not there at all, which means that the artist either has made a deliberate decision against the mountain, which is interesting in itself, or is in fact standing on Mount Fuji. The echoes of Tolkien's story can be seen throughout all media, you know, music, movies, tabletop role-playing games, and video games. Not only had The Lord of the Rings found the fan base that critics had once searched so desperately to identify, it had discovered that this fan base was one of the most lucrative and passionate fan bases that could exist. I would argue that the Lord of the Rings popularity with particularly high school and college age students would lead to the distinct YA genre that we know and love today. The Lord of the Rings had gone from being a book examined and discussed by academics to being a pop culture monolith back to being a book to be discussed by experts with the new vital addition of fans turned scholars to add to that conversation. And I would like to posit that rather than just being a one-off incident, for The Lord of the Rings, this has become a cycle. Because following the 1960s boom, The Lord of the Rings was not doomed to fall into nerdy obscurity. Many film adaptations of The Lord of the Rings had been attempted. Many, many of those are utterly unwatchable. But if you do want to watch them anyway, I actually have a whole series where I watch them and talk about them. So, you know, check that out once you're done here. But as the 20th century came to a close, a new light was on the horizon. New Line Cinema had purchased the rights and signed off on three 
live action feature length films with indie horror flick director Peter Jackson at the helm. The Lord of the Rings buzz was back, but this time it had the early internet to facilitate it. Fandom culture, once tied down to physically published magazines and costly convention meetups, flourished on the early internet, where mass emails and news websites took over more formal means of communication. And the Lord of the Rings fandom, bolstered by news about the movies, was one of the most boisterous. There were a lot of different fan sites and forums back then, but in 1999, two friends got together and made the OneRing.net. It was dedicated to posting any and all news about the Lord of the Rings movies, so dedicated, in fact, that one of the website's founders flew to New Zealand and tried to sneak onto the set of The Lord of the Rings in order to get some info. Although initially kicked out by security, she was later invited back by Peter Jackson in order to do an official tour. This established a long-standing relationship between the website and the Peter Jackson franchise so that they would be the first on the scene for any and all Lord of the Rings news. And once they came out, the movies did not disappoint. They're among the most ambitious film projects of all time, with all three films shot shot over a 438 day shoot with hundreds of artists and filmmakers and actors living in New Zealand for years in order to accomplish the project. The budget was $281 million, that's almost $500 million in today's money, but despite their reckless ambition, it more than paid off. It's one of the most high grossing film series ever made, and it won 17 Academy Awards. It is and still remains one of the most culturally significant film series of all time. And just as the books before it, it became a cultural phenomenon. There were posters, action figures, and references at every turn, and more frighteningly accurate Gollum impressions than frankly I knew what to do with. We want it. We need it. The Lord of the Rings had returned to the cultural zeitgeist with force, and although I was only born in 1999, so I didn't experience the full range of the hype, by the mid-2000s, it was still very much part of my life. The echoes of this second wave of hype can still be felt in the media today. In an article reflecting on the impact of Peter Jackson's movies, Andrew Liptak says, A decade and a half later, and the film industry has taken to heart some lessons from their success. Audiences are well versed in the language of science fiction and fantasy films, and it's rare to see a film announced without it being couched as part of some sort of larger property or franchise. 47 years after the book's publication, The Lord of the Rings was still impacting literature, media, and culture in untold ways. Of course, as it always does, this hype started to die down eventually. And although I doubt we'll ever see quite as big of a resurgence as we had in the 1960s or the 2000s, I would argue that this cycle is still continuing. It happened with the Hobbit movies, a burst of conversation and hype about the story, a hundred different news articles talking about the, the books, the movies, and their impact on culture, and then a quieter period where old fans of the story and the new ones that had just been created by the new media are able to sit down and engage in the story. It happened with the Rings of Power too, and I would say it's probably going to happen every time a new piece of Lord of the Rings media is released. Now, we all probably have thoughts about the releasing of new Lord of the Rings media. I too fear it turning into a Marvel or a Star Wars lookalike, bloated and just throwing out prequels and sequels and hard hitting streaming service spin offs until it's entirely unrecognizable from what it once was. But maybe we can take a little comfort in knowing that this isn't anything new. When The Lord of the Rings first blew up and became a part of pop culture, there were a lot of people that didn't get it. They dug too deep for allegory or got lost in little lore details or only looked at it on a very surface level. But a lot of people did honestly fall in love with The Lord of the Rings, and it created a whole new community of creative and powerful minds that were able to keep discussing The Lord of the Rings and keep it alive in their hearts until it blew up again. So next time you're worried about The Lord of the Rings going mainstream, it's okay to just sit back, buckle up, 
and enjoy the ride. It's happened before, it'll happen again, and I think that new people falling in love with The Lord of the Rings is hardly ever a bad thing. I would love to hear what you guys think about this. I was born a little bit too late to be around for most of this, so all of my knowledge is secondhand, but if you were around when all of this was happening, I would love to hear your perspective. For any of you, what role has The Lord of the Rings and The Lord of the Rings in culture played in your life? If you got to this point in the video, you, you might as well just like it, and you should probably subscribe because we are building a fantastic little community here, and I would love to have you join it. I filmed this video last week, so it is not necessarily up to date with what is currently happening on my channel, but last week's video blew up in a way that I could not have anticipated, especially for a video that I wrote and filmed in one day on a whim. I just want to say that I'm super grateful to everyone that watched that video and everyone that subscribed, especially my new subscribers and my old subscribers, which I suppose is all of you. I had to stop in and say thank you because you guys are really, you're really making my dreams come true. Appreciate that. Thank you all so much for watching, liking, subscribing, and chatting with me in the comments, and I hope that you all have a very happy hobbity day.